Hey everybody, this is 8-Bit Flashback, and today I'm going to show you how to install a beta version of RetroArch on the PlayStation Classic. And this will allow you to play a bunch of new systems, such as Super Nintendo, Game Boy, Sega Genesis, Arcade, Nintendo 64, Neo Geo, plus much more. And on top of all these new systems you can play, there's also a different version of the emulator for PlayStation that plays the games a whole lot better. And before we get started, please keep in mind this is a beta version, so it does have some issues. But hopefully these issues can be corrected in future releases. Also, anytime you mod or hack your console, you risk the chance of bricking your console. So please proceed at your own risk. So the first thing we want to do is head over to the BlameSync download page. And I'm going to be downloading BlameSync 0.4.1. And I would like to take the time now to give a special thanks to everyone out there in the hacking community that helped make this possible, such as CompCom, Dan the Man, and many more out there. So for that download, you want to make sure you pick the appropriate operating system. I'm going to be using Windows 10 in this video, so I'll be picking the Windows download right here. So you want to go ahead and click on this right here, and I'm going to go ahead and save this to my desktop. But you can save this wherever you want, but for this video, to keep everything organized, I am going to be keeping everything on the desktop. So after clicking on that, that's going to bring up a save box, and then I'm going to select save as, and then to my desktop. Now depending on what browser you're going to use, this layout might be a little bit different, but you should be able to save that to whatever destination you choose. And now I'm going to head over to modmyclassic.com and I will make sure to put all these links down below in the description so they're easy to find. So if we scroll down just a little bit on this page, we're going to find a couple downloads. We're going to go ahead and download the first one, which is going to be the PSC boot menu. So we're going to click on that download right there. Then we're going to go ahead and save that to the desktop as well. Also, just to give you a heads up, in this video, I will be showing you how to install RetroArch and get that up and running on the PlayStation Classic. For a full BleemSync tutorial, that will be in a separate video. Now it's time to go to the second link, and that's going to be for the PlayStation Classic RetroArch Cores. So if we click right there, that's going to take you to a different page. And this is going to give you a list of all the RetroArch Cores that are available for the PlayStation Classic. Now there's about 90 of these cores available, so you can pick and choose the ones you want, or you can just download them all at once, which is what I'm going to do. So if I scroll down to the bottom, I can find the All Core Zip, and that'll be all 90 of these cores. So I'm going to go ahead and click on this and save it to my desktop as well. Now keep in mind, if you have one of the previous hacks installed on your PlayStation Classic, like the GPG hacks, you probably want to have that uninstalled and have a fresh PlayStation Classic before you try doing this mod. And if you're looking to uninstall the GPG hacks, I do have a video about that and that will be in the description down below. Now for BlimSync users, this is compatible if you already have that set up and you're using 0.4.1. And for this video today, I will be using a completely unmodded PlayStation Classic. So I got everything downloaded that I need, so I'm going to go ahead and minimize my internet window. And here's all the files that I just downloaded. Now it's time to go ahead and prepare a USB flash drive or hard drive, and I'm using a 2.0 flash drive. So after plugging in my flash drive, if I right click on it, I can select format, and I'm going to format that at FAT32. And I have heard XFAT works as well, but the only thing I have tested is FAT32. So now that I have that flash drive formatted, it's time to go ahead and find it and pull it back up. Now we're going to go ahead and rename it. So right now it's named SamDisk, and if I right click on it, I can rename it to Sony, and I'm going to do that in all capital letters. Once we have the flash drive or hard drive renamed, it's time to go ahead and transfer over some folders. So we're going to start with the first download we did, which was BlimSync. So I'm going to go ahead and open up that archive, and now I'm going to extract the contents of this and put that on the root of the flash drive. And that's going to be about 500 megabytes, so it might take a few minutes, but I'm going to go ahead and fast forward here. Once that's done, we go ahead and close the archive window over here. And now we're on to the next one. This is going to be the boot menu bundle. So we're going to open this up. And inside here, we're going to extract all the contents and put that on the root of the flash drive as well. And this will actually overwrite some of those files that we already put on the flash drive, but that's okay because that's what it's supposed to do. Now, if you are already using BlimSync 0.4.1, then your flash drive is already ready to go to this point. And this is the step you're going to start at. You're going to start off with adding the boot menu bundle archive. And you should get a prompt asking if you want to replace some of those files. Just select yes, because that's what we want to do. Now we have all those files in place. Now it's time to move on to the next archive, which is going to be the all cores or whatever cores you selected to download. So now it's time to open up the RetroArch folder on the flash drive, then the config folder, then the RetroArch folder again, and then down to the core folder. And this is where all our new cores are going to go. And inside here, we already have a couple different cores, and what these actually are is emulators, and we have one for the Nintendo 64 and one for PlayStation. So now I'm going to select every core that's inside the All Core Zip archive and extract those to the core folder on the flash drive. And when I do this, I do get a prompt asking if I want to replace two files in the destination, and what that's referring to is those two cores that were already in there, and all that's going to do is just overwrite and put the same ones in there. Now on the right side of the screen here, we're going to hit that back button until we get back to the root of the flash drive, and we're going to find that RetroArch folder again. So I'm going to go ahead and click on the RetroArch folder, and then the system folder, 
Then inside here is where all the BIOS is going to go for certain systems like PlayStation, Dreamcast, and Arcade. Those all require certain BIOSes to run properly. Now the BIOSes are not going to be included, so these are something you're going to have to search on Google for so you can get these added to the BIOS directory. So on the left side of the screen here, I got a bunch of different BIOSes already stored in my computer. So I'm going to go ahead and copy all these and paste these inside that system folder on the USB flash drive. And again, all these BIOSes are pretty easy to find just using Google. For instance, for PlayStation, just search PlayStation BIOS download, and that should put you in the right direction. And the majority of these BIOSes I've added are in a zip archive format, and these are mostly for MAME and Arcade. But I do have a couple in here for the PlayStation and Dreamcast as well. Okay, now that I got all my BIOSes added, I'm gonna hit that back button again on the USB flash drive and get back to the root of the flash drive. Now it's time to add some games to test out, and you can actually put these anywhere you want on the flash drive, but to keep this simple, I'm gonna keep everything on the root of the flash drive. So I'm just gonna right click and create a new folder and label this A Test Games. And the reason I'm naming it with the letter A first is because it'll show up first in alphabetical order when I'm trying to search inside RetroArch, so it'll make it easier to find. Then inside this folder is where I'm gonna put all my games, and I'm gonna keep those systems separated by creating different folders for each system, like Super Nintendo, Sega Genesis, Nintendo 64, PlayStation, etc. So I got a bunch of different games for various different systems that are already stored on my computer. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy all these and paste these inside my new game directory on my USB flash drive. And as you can see here, each system has its own folder and I'm just doing this to keep everything nice and organized. And again, you don't have to do it this way. You can put those games wherever you want on your flash drive or hard drive and name that folder whatever you want. This is just an example to show you how I'm doing it. So for the PlayStation ROM format, I have heard that various formats are playable, such as Ebu and Bin and Q. But for this video, I'm just going to be demonstrating Bin and Q files only. So after you get all your games transferred over to the USB flash drive, it's ready for a test. But keep in mind, this is not set up to use BlameSync. If you try to use BlameSync, it's just going to show a couple blank games. But in a future video, once they get a final release with RetroArch and BlameSync combined together, I will do a full tutorial and show you how to do everything. So even though this current setup that I've showed you so far is not ready for BlameSync use, I will still demonstrate it working in the video just to give you an example. Okay, it's time to head over to the PlayStation Classic. And for the first step, I'm gonna go ahead and unplug the power supply, that USB power. Now I'm gonna go ahead and plug in my USB flash drive. And now I'm gonna plug the power back in. And once that orange light turns on, I'm gonna go ahead and turn the power back on. So it should begin to boot up like normal and you're gonna be greeted by that PlayStation logo. But then after that, it should go right to the boot menu for RetroArch and BlameSync. Now, if for some reason it just boots up like normal and you don't get greeted by this new boot menu, just go down and plug that power and try this one more time. But if you do reach this new boot menu, you should be good to go. And keep in mind, you're not gonna have to unplug this every time. Most of the time, you should be able to just power this off and power it back on and reach this new boot menu. But every once in a while, you might have to do a power cycle and go ahead and unplug it and start over. And just for an example now, I'm going to show you BlameSync working, but keep in mind if you try to use this with the current setup that I've showed you so far, it's just going to display a couple blank games. And for an example here, I have eight games installed using the BlameSync method. And as you can see, it uses the original user interface, just like the original games. But to be honest, it's not a very user-friendly experience to set up all the games when using BlameSync. There's editing involved for each game you add, so it's kind of a pain. And on top of that, it uses the stock emulator to play the PlayStation games, which isn't that great. The emulator that RetroArch uses is far better in my opinion, and it plays the games pretty close to full speed. So really, the direction we should be headed is to just bypass the stock emulator altogether and only use the RetroArch version. So now I've powered off the console, then powered it back on, and now it's time to test out RetroArch. And to select either one of these, you just move left or right, and then push the X button to select it. And for those of you out there that are already familiar with RetroArch, then you should be able to get the hang of this pretty quick. But for those who are not, it might be a bit of a learning curve. And right now, a lot of the features with RetroArch are not working properly, such as scanning the directories, and that's because this is a beta version, but hopefully with future releases, this will get corrected. And right now, by default, the frames per second counter is enabled, but if we go to the Settings tab, then scroll down to On-Screen Display, and then On-Screen Notifications, we can go ahead and turn that off if you choose to. But for this video, I'm going to leave that on so we can see what the frames per second is running at when I test games. So if you want to select a core emulator, you will have to do that manually by going all the way to the left, and then select Load Core. Now you can scroll through all the cores that you've added. I've got about 90 of them, so I've got a bunch to go through. And for my first test, I'm gonna try out MAME 2003. So I'm gonna select that by pushing X, and that'll load the core. Now it's time to load the content, which would be the game. So I'm gonna select Load Content, and then scroll down to the disk icon. Then scroll down to Media, which is gonna be my flash drive or hard drive. So if I select that, that's gonna scan my directory that's inside my flash drive. And then from here, you just navigate to wherever your games are located on your flash drive. And mine are gonna be inside the A Test Games folder. And as you can see here, I got all my games organized in separate folders to make it a lot easier when I'm trying to select a game. 
So the first game I'm going to test is Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and this is the actual arcade version, not to be mixed up with the arcade game that was on NES. And I haven't tested a whole lot of games for MAME yet, but out of all the games I have tested, they seem to be running pretty well, and the frames per second seems to be pretty high. And for everyone out there that's looking to try this mod or hack out, it's pretty simple to do, and it's pretty simple to remove. All you have to do is unplug the flash drive, power it off, power it back on, and it's back to normal. And that's because with this mod, everything runs off that USB flash drive, so when we unplug that, everything just goes back to normal. And because this is an arcade game, you will have to add credits, and you can do that by pushing the select button. And as far as the rest of the button mapping, it does seem to be working correctly. I'm moving left and right, and my fighting buttons are working like they should. But with certain games, it might not work correctly, but you can always use RetroArch to do some button remapping. And if you're looking to exit game, you just push start and select at the same time, and that'll bring up the RetroArch menu. From there, we can either close the content, or we can select another core by pushing the circle or the back button. But if you select close content, what that's gonna do is close the current core that you're using, and you're gonna to have to select a new core to use along with some new content. But you also have the option to keep that current core loaded and just pick a new game to run that's compatible. But I'm just gonna go ahead and select a new core to use, and we're gonna select the PlayStation, and this is actually the PCSX rearm version for RetroArch. So this is a little bit similar to the one that's built in, but this is a lot better because it uses RetroArch settings that's optimized a lot better for the PlayStation Classic, like it should be. Now I'm going to select load content and then navigate to my flash drive and pick a game to play in my PlayStation folder. And let's test out Tekken 3. And as you can see here, it does recognize artwork, but I only have one picture inside here. That is Spyro, so that's the only one that's displaying. And for Tekken 3, I am using the US version or the NTSC, so it is running at full speed. And I did test this on the built-in emulator for the PlayStation Classic, and I can assure you it is running a lot smoother on the RetroArch version. When playing this game inside RetroArch, those frames per second stay pretty consistent, and they usually never drop below 55. When I'm playing this inside the built-in emulator for the PlayStation Classic, the frames per second can drop all the way down to 50 at times, making that game run a little bit slower. And this is not to be confused with the PAL version that's already built into the PlayStation Classic. That is testing with this version, which is the NTSC version. And I obviously haven't had time to test all the games using the RetroArch version. But out of all the games I have tested, which is about 10 of them, they seem to be running a lot better when I'm using the RetroArch version of this emulator. Okay, let's load another core. This is Mupin64 for Nintendo 64. And we'll try out Ridge Racer. So as you can see here, the emulation is not doing so great. That sound is a little bit choppy, and the frames per second is running a little bit low. If you're looking to save a game when using RetroArch, you can do that by pushing Start and Select, and then go down to Save State, and that'll save the game wherever it was at. And if you want to load that game, you just push Start and Select, and then select Load State, and that'll bring you back to right where you were. And as you can see here, the frames per second is all over the place, but to be fair, I'm not really sure where it ran on the original system. I'm guessing it wasn't a full 60 frames per second, but it had to be better than this. And just to give you a heads up, for most of the Nintendo 64 games, you are going to have to remap your controller so it'll work properly, especially for the games that require an analog stick. For this particular game, Ridge Racer, it does not require any button mapping, and it works just like it is. And I did try to test out some more Nintendo 64 games, and they all seem to have similar results. They seem to be playable, but not running that great. Now I'm going to test out a Game Boy game, and just to let you know, I did try testing out some Dreamcast games, and every time I tried to load a Dreamcast game, the system would actually crash and power off, so there's something going on with the Dreamcast simulator. At this point, it's not working properly. Also, another big issue with RetroArch is the power button will not be functional. When you want to exit, what you're going to have to do is do that through the menu, go all the way over to the left, select Quit RetroArch, and that will shut down RetroArch and the system itself. And for the original Game Boy games, it seems to run those just fine, and I'm not noticing any issues. And the original Game Boy version of Tetris is probably my favorite version, because I've played this more than any other one out there. So from this point on, I'm just going to give a brief description of how the game plays and what emulator I'm using, and then just let the game play on. Now I'm going to go ahead and test out a Game Boy Advance game. This is Rayman, and it seems to be playing great. And this is using the Menafen GBA Core. Now I'm going to be testing out a MAME 2003 Plus Core with a Neo Geo game. And this is World Heroes. The game seems to be running okay, but it does seem a little bit sluggish at times. Maybe not quite full speed.
And also, you can probably already hear this, but the music is a little bit choppy. Okay, now let's test the Genesis Plus GX Core, and we'll try Mortal Kombat, I believe this is 2. And the game seems to be running really nice. Alright, now I'm testing a Super Nintendo 9X Core, and this is Super Mario World, and it seems to be running really smooth, but the frames per second seems to be locked at around 50. Now I know not all games run at 60 frames per second, but I believe this one did. Okay, now I'm using a MAME 2000 core, and this is Junior Pac-Man. This is one of my favorite Pac-Mans. I remember growing up playing this. It used to be at our local airport. This was the only arcade game they had, so I spent a lot of quarters playing this game. And this game seems to be playing great. And for the last game I'm going to test out today, I'm going to be using that MAME 2000 core as well, and this is Street Fighter 2, and the game seems to be playing great. Okay, it's that time again, it's time for me to go, but I'll try to keep you updated as much as I can with the PlayStation Classic Hack and Scene. And if you like that video, don't forget to click that like button and subscribe, and have yourself a great day, and I'll see you next time.